Hey everybody, how we doing? Uh, video number six. Here we go. This is uh, Pharmacology Point One. Again, everything's been great. Huge success. Everybody's really enjoying the videos. Thank you for your feedback. I really appreciate it. Um, I think I've answered most of the perverse questions that have come out. We'll leave all the other ones to your imagination. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Admin stuff. Um, again, nothing sensitive, nothing classified. Uh, Mike Biamonti. Uh, School of Operational Medicine for the FBI. Having a good time with this. Hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're all COVID-free still and uh, kind of staying under the radar. What we're going to talk about today is drugs. Yes! <laughs> I like it. I just love that clip. I think it's great. It's from an old movie. I don't know. Some of you have been around a while, may have seen it. I just don't remember what the name of it is, but that clip always stuck in my head. Um, when I teach pharmacology uh, at the paramedic level, I always try to impress upon new providers. Uh, pharmacology is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, we shouldn't fear pharmacology. We shouldn't be intimidated by the drugs we're about to give somebody. We should have a healthy respect for them. And the other thing I'd really try to impress upon new medical providers, regardless of what your level is, um, is medications that we give somebody do not automatically bestow upon the body some new and exciting uh, uh, capability that you didn't have before. It doesn't work like that. There's no magic pill that, well, your body couldn't do this before. Well, now that you're taking this pill, well, now your body can do it. No, at least not in the emergency world, uh, the world of EMS. The drugs we give are fairly stovepiped uh, to certain diseases and certain ailments. Uh, so obviously we're not, again, we're not physicians. We don't have a prescription pad. We can start writing prescriptions for 18,000 different things. But the medications that we can give are designed to amplify or reduce the body's ability to react in a certain way. That's pretty much it. That's what the body does. And it's really pretty wild as to what the body does and how it does it. So right out of the gate, we're going to talk about the way different, uh, the way drugs come packaged or the way they uh, come to us in the sense of a, a generic versus brand versus uh, chemical names, uh, official names, that kind of thing. So what we're going to discuss, uh, among other things on this video, is how the drugs come packaged, what difference does it make? A lot of people will have that question. Well, what's the difference between a brand name and a generic name? We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about routes of administration. Uh, just because you can uh, give a drug, you have to make sure you can give it the right way. And one other thing I typically try to impress upon providers is just because you can give a drug, um, when I say can give a drug, just because you have the uh, the certification in your pocket, you know, the training, the know-how, and the protocol doesn't mean you have to. Uh, good clinical judgment. All right? Don't be one of those cookbook medics. You need to look at somebody and figure out, okay, what, why, and what. What's going on with this patient? Why is it happening? What can I do about it? So do you have anything in your toolbox that you can give to this patient that will help them? Uh, so just because somebody's having chest pain, as an example, doesn't mean they have to get nitroglycerin. Well, your protocol may say that, but good clinical judgment. So let's take a look at this slide here real quick. And what we're going to look at is brand name versus generic name. This is a question that typically comes up as to, well, what's the difference? Okay, here's my understanding of it, uh, and this is how I think about it. Your brand name drugs, and I'm just going to use Tylenol as an example. All right, Tylenol versus acetaminophen. Tylenol is a brand name. Acetaminophen is a generic name. Okay, what's the difference? Let's say you have a I don't know, 500 milligram tablet of Tylenol. It says Tylenol, clear as day on the box. And you go to any supermarket USA and you pick up Tylenol and you pay, who knows, $6 for that bottle of Tylenol. I have no idea, whatever it costs. Okay, fine, you've just paid $6 for Tylenol. Well, now you look on the shelf just below that Tylenol that you purchased, and you see acetaminophen, 500 milligrams. Huh, okay. And that's only $3. Okay. Well, that's a generic version, all right? And from the slide here that you can see, 
you have the brand name versus the generic name, and it gives you a pretty long explanation as to what's what, and you know, uh, as per the FDA, blah, blah, blah. Here's the skivvy. Your generic brand drugs aren't as closely scrutinized when it comes to their actual dosage. So, let's say Tylenol. And again, these numbers are made up in my head, so don't take me to the bank on this one. Don't, uh, don't yell at me if I'm grossly incorrect, but this is the general gist of it. Is if you have a 500 milligram tablet of Tylenol, brand name Tylenol in front of you, as per the FDA, if it's a brand name drug, that drug, if analyzed and looked at under a microscope, has to be within a certain parameter of accuracy to 500 milligrams, give or take, and I have no idea. I'm just going to use one milligram. I have no idea. So if they analyze that tablet, if there's 499 milligrams in there or 501 milligrams in there, it meets the specifications to be a brand, you know, level. I don't know, something like that. Whereas generic may be a little looser in its regulations to where, and again, these numbers mean nothing. I have no idea where the tablet you have in front of you may be 495 milligrams or 505 milligrams. There's a little wider margin of error in the accuracy, but it's still the same drug. So when you're over-the-counter medications, that difference of a couple of milligrams is not going to make a difference. So people who turn around and say, well, I can't take generic, it doesn't work for me. Well, they're probably wrong. They just don't know any better. Now, there are certain drugs that a doctor will prescribe, um, Synthroid as an example, or other types of drugs, uh, blood thinners perhaps. There are other drugs out there that are extremely sensitive to dosing to where you really do want the brand name drug because you want as close to accurate as possible to that exact dose that that doctor, whatever he or she wants, uh, so that's where your brand name typically comes into play. So if your doctor looks at you and says, oh, I'm going to prescribe this medication to you, and they don't check a little box on a prescription pad or whatever it used to be, and they want you to get the brand name drug. So when you go to the pharmacist, the pharmacist will tell you, no, your doctor has written this for brand name only. That might be by design. Maybe the doctor wants it that way for that reason. Uh, whereas when you get to the Pharmacy, you may have your choice of brand versus generic. That's really it in a nutshell. Um, there's also what's called a chemical name and an official name. A chemical name is, you know, ethyl 1, methyl 4, ethyl methyl bad shit, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the chemical compound makeup of that drug is. Something we would never see in a pre-hospital environment, nor do I ever want to see. So that's the chemical name. The official name is really just the generic name with USP at the end of it. Uh, USP is United States Pharmacopoeia. That's it. And very rarely do we ever work within those uh, terminal, within those terms in the pre-hospital environment. So what we're going to see is uh, brand name and generic name. Those are the two names we're going to see. Uh, so let me go ahead and pull this slide down. And let's talk about routes of administration. I'm going to refer to my book over here. Again, I want to make sure I'm staying on track. So how do we give this drug, a drug, whatever drug? Well, part of your protocol as a conscientious and responsible medical provider, whether you're an EMT, AEMT, paramedic, doesn't matter, uh, even EMRs in assisting uh, the patients in getting their medications, they have to know the proper route of administration. So let's use this as an example. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a friend of mine uh, couldn't swallow tablets. And my uncle, as an example, is just, it's just one of those things. He just cannot swallow a capsule or a tablet. They have a hard time doing it for whatever reason. So let's take a capsule. And you see the capsule, it's got two sides to it, kind of sticks together. Well, what people would do, especially with kids, in a scenario to where somebody can't swallow a capsule, is they'll break the capsule open, empty the contents of the capsule into a spoon, and put apple juice, or not apple juice, applesauce or whatever, and I'll eat it, and okay, great. There's probably a really good chance that that drug is not going to work now, because the drug was not designed to go into the stomach. The stomach is a very hostile environment, right? Hydrochloric acid, all these digestive enzymes. Uh, oh, hope I didn't lose anybody. Nope, we're still here? Okay, good. 
Um, so when people take that medication, as an example, out of the capsule and they put it into their stomach, well, it's going to reduce the effectiveness, uh, the efficacy, effectiveness, kind of the same word, um, of that drug. Because that drug is designed to be absorbed in the small intestine. And the capsule that surrounds that drug is designed to protect that drug until it gets to the small intestine where eventually now that capsule breaks down, releases the contents of the medication, and now it's going to be absorbed in the small intestine to its fullest effect. So that's how some of these drugs come packaged. So enterocoded aspirin, as an example, the reason that we give baby aspirin in uh, situations where somebody's having chest pain, so somebody's having chest pain, they say, oh, go ahead and take, uh, you know, two to four baby aspirin, Chew them up, chew them up, chew them up, and swallow them. Okay, why do we tell somebody to chew up baby aspirin when they're having a heart attack? Well, because the absorption rate in the oral mucosa of that baby aspirin is going to be much, much faster than taking, say, an enterocoded aspirin and swallowing it. An enterocoded aspirin has a coating on it to prevent it from breaking down in the stomach, and it will break down and absorb in the small intestine. Uh, Aspirin or acetosilic acid, brand versus trade, is, uh, I'm sorry, brand versus generic, is very caustic to the stomach. It irritates the stomach. So when people have ulcers or peptic ulcer disease and that kind of thing, they don't like to take aspirin because it'll irritate their stomach. Okay. Um, so they'll take an enterocoded aspirin. Well, if somebody's having a heart attack and you give them an enterocoded aspirin, it's going to take too long for the aspirin to break down and do its job, which is why we give them baby aspirin. They chew it and it absorbs in the oral mucosa and acts much quicker. So understanding how medications are given, understanding the proper route of administration is really very important for us uh, so that we can give the drug the best possible way. So let me put this up on the screen here. What we're looking at here is different routes of administrations. There's what's called the parenteral route and the enteral route. Okay, parenteral route is Needles, if you want to think of it that way, injections, uh, respiratory, so inhaling drugs, cutaneous, going through the skin. Uh, so those are different uh, parenteral routes. An enteral route is anything via the GI tract. So from the top to the bottom, anything via the GI tract. So if there are certain medications that are taken orally versus there are medications out there that are taken rectally, uh, suppositories as an example. I had a... <laughs> A young sailor years ago, uh, when I was a corpsman, I told him to take these, take this medication for your nausea, for your vomiting, um, come back in a few days and tell me how you feel. Okay. Five days later, he comes back. I said, how do you feel? He goes, I feel fine, doc, but all oh, those pills you gave me, they tasted awful. And I look back at his record and I said, you dumbass. I said, those were suppositories. You weren't supposed to eat those things. Oh, that's disgusting, doc. I don't want to stick them. So... Yes, medications can go rectally, and I know I'm going to get my chops broken for telling that story, but that's okay. So there are different routes of administrations. So let me go ahead and put another slide up here. And what this is showing is more the, uh, the parenteral route. Just as an example, we can give intramuscular injections, subcutaneous injections, intravenous, intraosseous, intradermal. Uh, there's a number of different routes of administration when we talk about parenteral. And with parenteral, we're also talking about transcutaneous and respiratory, and we'll get to that in a second. So if you're a, a medical provider um, and you have to give somebody uh, epinephrine for allergic reactions, years ago, I shouldn't say years ago, it's still protocol in a number of different places, but as a general rule, whether you're an EMT, EMR, paramedic, if you're going to give epinephrine for somebody having an allergic reaction, let's say, as an example, a lot of protocols still suggest that you give that epinephrine subcutaneously. Depending on what your protocol is, maybe 0.3 milligrams, who knows what your protocol is. But if you give that medication subcutaneously, and we're going to talk about different things that will affect rate of absorption here in just a little bit, but um, the subcutaneous tissue is just fat tissue. So it does have blood supply, it's just not a great blood supply. So remember in the last video, we talked about hypoperfusion. So if you're shocky from, say, anaphylactic shock, and your blood is pulling, I'm sorry, your body is pulling blood towards the core and away from one of its most 
non-essential organs in the, in the body's mind frame or uh, mindset is the skin. The body does not consider the skin an essential organ. So in periods of shock or hypoperfusion, it's going to pull blood away from the skin, making you cool and pale. Uh, the diaphoresis comes from the stimulation of your sympathetic nervous system when you start to sweat. But So if you're pulling blood away from subcutaneous tissue in your skin, and you give a medication into that subcutaneous space, well, it's really not going to be absorbed. It's going to sit there. So what a lot of systems are going to now more than uh, more often than not in the cases of anaphylaxis or potential anaphylaxis is going IM or intramuscular, uh, which is a bit deeper. It's in the muscle versus the subcutaneous tissue. Muscle is more vascular. It's going to absorb faster and have a greater effect on your patient's condition. So if we look at this next slide here, it's just a picture of an EpiPen. And this is an EpiPen that I've actually cut open uh, in a number of different classes, I show how you can actually get up to four to five doses of epinephrine out of one EpiPen. Uh, and maybe when we get into the anaphylaxis section of these videos, I'll uh, play a little B-roll clip or whatever they call it on how to cut this thing open and actually get a number of uh, doses out. But what you're looking at there is the actual guts of an EpiPen. Look at the size of that needle. That needle is tiny. If you look at the EpiPen itself, you would swear that there's a, a like a Game of Thrones sword in that thing, and it's going to go through someone's leg and straight through to the bed. Now, the needle for that thing is tiny. So when we talk about giving intramuscular injections at the EMT level, or not even EMT, if you're using an EpiPen, period, and you're going to be giving this uh, medication via the IM route, the intramuscular route, and you push it up against the leg, if nobody's told you, I'm telling you now, you really got to make sure there's nothing in the way. Uh, wallet, credentials, cell phone, anything against that leg will get in the way of that little tiny needle. And you have to push the needle, uh, the, the applicator, into the thigh to squeeze the subcutaneous fat out of the way so that that needle can make it down into the intramuscular space. So there's a method to the madness when it comes to that EpiPen and how it's delivered. Uh, so that's the intramuscular injection as one of the parenteral routes. So let me change the slide again. And let's bring up this one. This is showing a number of different routes of administration. Uh, so looking on the upper left-hand side, uh, or I shouldn't say upper left-hand side, I'm looking at it differently than you are. Uh, one of the first things you're going to look at is uh, instaglucose, a tube, if you will. That is considered to be via the enteral route. It's PO or per oral, but more specifically when we're talking about uh, instant glucose for hypoglycemic patients, that paste needs to be squeezed in what's called the buccal route, B-U-C-C-A-L. Uh, the buccal route of administration is between the cheek and gum. So people who dip tobacco, uh, they stick that wad of, of tobacco between their cheek and gum, that's the buccal route. And the reason they jam it in there is because it's very vascular. It's that oral mucosa. It's going to absorb very, very quickly. And that's the effect that they want with that tobacco. Well, that's the same effect we want with oral glucose. I've seen a lot of providers take that tube of paste, squeeze it into somebody's mouth and tell them to swallow it, eat it. It doesn't work like that. It's not going to be the best way for this drug to be absorbed. So the buccal route of administration is better. Uh, next thing I'm going to show you is a nebulizer. So the nebulizer, or the handheld nebulizer, is again more of a, a parenteral route, but it's the respiratory route, or uh, so inhaling it. So if we have somebody who has asthma, which is nine times out of ten why we're doing this, whether they use their home uh, meter dose inhaler or EMS comes along with a handheld nebulizer, what we're trying to do is get that drug down into the bronchioles of the lungs where the smooth muscle resides past the cartilaginous support of your bronchioles so that we can dilate those bronchioles and allow somebody to breathe easier. So when you see somebody who doesn't know how to smoke, and I'm not a smoker, I never have been, but I know how to smoke. I've read books. Um, if you're going to inhale, you take a drag on that cigarette, you inhale, you hold it for a second, you blow it out. That's the whole idea is you want to get the effect of that nicotine down into your lungs. People who, you can see they, they 
they, they breathe it in and they blow it out right away. It never even reaches their lungs. These people who don't want to smoke or don't like smoking, they're doing it for whatever stupid reason. But with nebulizers, it's the same thing. You want to tell this person to get that, get that drug all the way down in there and hold it in their lungs as long as they can and then exhale. But it's tricky because you're telling somebody who's having a hard time breathing to hold their breath. So you're really fighting an uphill battle there. Uh, so we'll look at the next one here, and this is nitroglycerin. Uh, nitroglycerin comes in three different forms. So there's a nitroglycerin spray, and then the next slide is nitroglycerin sublingual tablet, and the next slide is a nitroglycerin paste. Nitroglycerin comes in an IV form. Uh, you can inject it sublingually. Nitroglycerin comes in a lot of different formats in the pre-hospital setting. So when we talk about giving somebody nitroglycerin, we have to understand how it's packaged and we have to understand how to give it. So uh, a tablet has to go under the tongue. It has to dissolve there. Um, what you'll see a lot of pre-hospital care providers do is they'll give aspirin and nitro at the same time, and that's fine. They'll give them a tablet of nitroglycerin, put it underneath the patient's tongue, and tell the patient, leave it there, let it sit under your tongue and dissolve, don't swallow it. Great, perfect instructions. They'll do that two, three times to the patient. Well, then they'll turn around and they'll give them four baby aspirin and they'll throw them in the patient's mouth and they don't give the patient any direction on what to do with it. So what does the patient do? They take the aspirin, they jam it under their tongue, and within a couple of minutes, the patient's got this pink frothy mush coming out of their mouth and it's doing nobody any good they haven't directed them to chew that aspirin and swallow it. So it's all about knowing how to use it or how to administer it. Um, the nitro paste in that, uh, in this final slide here, you'll see it's like toothpaste, essentially. Uh, but it's powerful stuff. So powerful, in fact, that you as a pre-hospital care provider, if you're dealing with somebody who has a transdermal patch on, and transdermal patches can come in any way, shape, or form, fentanyl patches, morphine patches, uh, nitroglycerin uh, patches, nicotine patches, doesn't matter. That drug is designed and formulated, chemically altered, to be absorbed through your skin. So if you come along, a Johnny Healthcare provider, and grab a hold of it with your bare hand, well, guess what? <laughs> now you've got a handful of it, you're going to feel the effect. Uh, we used to have a lot of fun with transdermal nitroglycerin when I was in the I was an EMS a long time ago, and we got into a little bit of trouble, but I'm not going to tell you what we did, but you can let your imagination run wild with you. We had a lot of fun with sublingual, I'm sorry, with uh, transdermal nitroglycerin. So let me go ahead and pull this slide off. All right. So we talked about different routes of administration. Drugs come in a number of different ways, but for the pre-hospital environment, we keep it pretty simple. Uh, we have parenteral route, we have enteral route, and uh, at the EMT level, I'm going to talk primarily about EMT drugs, but I am going to uh, wander off from side to side to the advanced level drugs too, but all the same rules apply. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You have to understand what you can give, how it's given, when is the appropriate time to give it, what are the indications, contraindications. You really got to be careful with a lot of this. All drugs, I don't care uh, what the drug is, is on a weight-based formula. So we should give this much drug to this patient based on their weight. Now, a lot of these drugs that we have come prepackaged, and I'll just use epinephrine as an example. Epinephrine uh, in the pre-hospital environment for ALS providers and cardiac arrest, boom, one milligram, it comes in 10 cc's. So there are cc's, a cubic centimeter and a milliliter are the same exact thing. And you'll hear those terms thrown around a lot. Oh, give them a cc of this or give them a milliliter of this. Same thing. A cc is a milliliter. A milliliter is a cc. Simple. Uh, liters, meters, and grams. And get into the metric system. We're not going to get crazy into that. We're not going to get into uh, drug calculations in this video. I don't want your heads to explode. But uh, we talk about milligrams. We're talking about a unit of, uh, of weight, if you will. We're talking about milliliters or cc's. We're talking about a unit of, uh, of volume. Um, so, and of course, we can talk all day about that. We're not going to get crazy into that. So let's talk a little bit about the nervous system. Remember, I promised you we're going to come back to the nervous system. And AMP is in everything we do. You just can't, especially in medicine, you can't get away from it. So the nervous system and the endocrine system are said to be the two dominant forces that control our body and what we do. And we're, so we're going to spend a lot of time on the nervous system here. 
because the terminology we use in pharmacology falls back to the nervous system. And it's a, it's a language. So if you ever looked at a package insert, right, you get a, a bottle of medication or anything, I don't care what it is, and you pull out this little piece of paper and it opens up like a scroll. It's got a little tiny writing on it. You can barely see it. And it gets into a vocabulary that is completely foreign to most people. Because what? Cholinergic and antagonist and agonist and sympathomimetic. What is? It's a whole language in and of itself. And pharmaceutical companies love to do this. This is why they get to charge you so much for the, for the medication. So we have to understand some of the basic language, some of the basic terms. So uh, two of the terms I just threw out, agonist versus antagonist. So when we talk about an agonist, an agonist is a drug that is going to stimulate the body to do something, right? Versus an antagonist is going to block it. So we'll use Narcan as an example. Narcan, by classification, is an opioid antagonist. So it blocks the receptor sites that an opioid drug would lock into to stimulate that site. Well, Narcan blocks that. Therefore, it's an antagonistic drug. Whereas you can have agonistic drugs. Uh, we'll talk about uh, albuterol later and how it's a bronchodilator. Or it's a, a beta-2 agonist. And I'll explain to you what beta-2 means here in a little bit. So understanding the terminology is important. So if I do throw that out there, I want you to understand Agonist means that it stimulates a response. Antagonist means it blocks a response. All right, so let's go ahead and put this up on screen. And we're going back to basic neurology 101. All right, central nervous system versus peripheral nervous system. We'll keep this simple because we've already uh, been through this. Central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord. Your peripheral nervous system is everything else. Simple. All right, so let's get a little bit more into the weeds now. Let's look at this slide. We're looking now at our, cent I'm sorry, uh, based on our peripheral nervous system, now we're gonna go a little deeper into the woods. We're gonna go into the autonomic versus somatic side of things. So when we look at somatic, we talk about sensory versus motor neurons. Remember we talked about that in one of the earlier videos. When we talk about a sensory neuron or an afferent pathway, that's that sensory neuron from, say, your fingertip to your brain telling you something is hot or cold. We have sensors everywhere in our body, in every organ, piece of our skin. It's all about sensory afferent pathways. Our efferent pathway is now the motor response to that stimuli or the response to that organ based on that sensory input. So that's all your somatic system does. Your autonomic system, autonomic sounds a lot like automatic, are more your unconscious things that happen in your body. Pupillary dilation or constriction, uh, gastrointestinal movement, heartbeat, blood vessel diameter, so on and so on and so on. Things we have almost no control over. Well, the two branches of your autonomic nervous system are your sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is known, again, as feed and breed. Parasympathetic is known as, I'm sorry, sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is feed and breed. As a general rule, and this is not 100% correct, but just for the purposes of keeping this simple, sympathetic nervous system speeds you up. Parasympathetic nervous system slows you down. Not completely accurate, but again, follow me down this rabbit hole. Another name or another term for sympathetic fibers or the nerve endings, uh, if you will, of your sympathetic nervous system are considered to be adrenergic fibers. I think of adrenergic as adrenaline, adrenaline uh, or epinephrine being the neurotransmitter for sympathetic nervous system. So adrenergic, adrenaline, sympathetic. So when we hear about an adrenergic response to a drug, that's a sympathetic response going to speed you up one way, shape, form, or another. Whereas cholinergic is dealing more with your parasympathetic nervous system. So when we talk about a cholinergic response, we're talking about a parasympathetic response, most of the time slowing us down. Not always, but sometimes. So those are different terms for sympathetic, parasympathetic. Now we also have to address what are called neurotransmitters. At every nerve ending, and we're not going to get into preganglionic synapse and postganglionic synapse. Again, I can stand, sit here all day and talk about this. I'm not going to beat you up that way. As a general rule, 
when we get to where the nerve ending comes in contact with that target organ, the target organ being whatever it's looking to stimulate or block, there is a synaptic gap, a synaptic cleft, a neuromuscular junction, whatever it is you want to call it, there is a gap there. And the impulse from the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system needs to be carried across that gap, right, that neuromuscular junction, and plug into a receptor site. So epinephrine is the neuromus or is the neurotransmitter for your sympathetic nervous system. So when a sympathetic impulse or an adrenergic impulse wants to cross over that junction, epi is what ferries it across. In the parasympathetic world, if you want a cholinergic impulse or a parasympathetic impulse to go across that gap, you need acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the thing that carries it across. Um, and there was a point I was going to make to that as far as, uh, oh, yes. So that's sympathetic, parasympathetic, adrenergic, cholinergic, and the neurotransmitters that carry the sympathetic impulse is epi. Neurotransmitter that carries the impulse for parasympathetic is acetylcholine. But now they have to plug in somewhere, and there are receptor sites on that target organ that will be stimulated or blocked and will trigger a response one way or the other. Within the sympathetic nervous system, we have what are known as alpha-beta receptors, alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3, beta-1, beta-2. The only ones we're really concerned with in the pre-hospital environment are alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2. Now think of a receptor site as a, an outlet and a wall. That's really what it is. You come along with a plug and you plug into it and you're going to stimulate a response out of that, out of that outlet. But when you pull the plug out of that outlet, well, that outlet lays there dormant, not doing a thing. So in order for an outlet or a receptor site to be stimulated, something has to plug into it. So if we come along and we plug epinephrine into alpha-1 or beta-1 or beta-2, we're going to get a predictable response. So let me go ahead and do this. Let me pull this slide down. Okay. So... Sympathetic nervous system, the two dominant receptor sites, and these receptor sites are all over your body, but we're going to talk just about a specific area here. Within the sympathetic nervous system, we have alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2. There are many more, but we're going to keep it simple. So when we talk about alpha stimulation, pardon me, we're talking primarily about blood vessel diameter. Again, like I said, we're kind of just hitting the tips of the icebergs here. So follow me down this rabbit hole. We're going to make it simple. So if we have an alpha adrenergic response, so we're talking about a sympathetic stimulus to an alpha receptor or an alpha agonist. It's going to the, that agonistic stimulation of alpha one. We're going to have blood vessel constriction. So think about epinephrine. Think about fight or flight. We're getting pumped up, ready to go. We're bringing our blood pressure up. We're taking that bottle of water that we showed in the last video, and we're constricting it. We're bringing our blood pressure up. We're getting ready to go to battle, and we're pulling blood away from the skin to our muscles, to our core organs, and getting ready for a fight. That's what fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system, is all about. So if I stimulate alpha-1, vasoconstricting. If I stimulate beta-1, there's beta-1, is beta 2. Easiest way to think about it is where do you find a lot of beta 1 receptor sites? In your heart. How many hearts do you have? Well, if you ask some people, they'll tell me I have none, but beta 1, one heart. Beta 2, two lungs. So if I stimulate beta 1, what's going to happen to my heart rate? It's going to go up. Like drinking a lot of coffee, smoking nicotine, getting ready to go into a fight. You know, you start, your heart rate starts going. If I stimulate beta 2, that's the lining of my bronchioles, I'm going to bronchodilate, bringing in more oxygen, more air, getting me ready to go to battle. Right? So when we talk about, as an example, if I gave you a drug, and this is how it's usually put in package inserts and in textbooks, this is a drug that is a beta 2 agonist with mild beta 1 agonistic properties. What the hell did he just say? Okay, I'm giving you a drug that is a beta-2 agonist. It's going to stimulate beta-2. So what happens? 
and bronchodilate. But it also has mild beta-1 agonistic properties. So it's also going to cause a little bit of tachycardia, beta-1 stimulation. What drug did I just give you? Albuterol. So why don't they just say, well, albuterol is going to bronchodilate and increase your heart rate a little bit. They can't sell books that way. Right? they, they got to make it fancy, more complicated. Uh, that's the world they live in. So that's just one example of how terminology becomes important in understanding alpha, beta, agonist, antagonist. We already said Narcan is an antagonistic drug. But it's an antagonist to opioids. There are opioid receptors all over your body. So if I have uh, heroin, morphine, fentanyl, whatever, come along and bind to an opioid receptor, well, it's going to stimulate that receptor. And it's going to give you that sense of euphoria, respiratory depression, so on and so on. Well, if you have a lot of that drug locked into all those receptors, you're going to have a more profound effect. So what Narcan does, it comes along and it bumps opioid out of that receptor site and it sits there and blocks opioid from coming in and stimulating it, thereby waking your patient up. Well, the thing is, if your patient has a lot of that drug on board, they've taken a lot of it, that, blood, that drug's not going away. It's floating around in your circulatory system. Eventually, that Narcan is going to drop out of that receptor site, and that opioid's going to come back in, and your patient's going to re-overdose. So Narcan isn't necessarily one of those fire-and-forget medications. You give it, and nine times out of ten, it works very well. But based on the amount of the drug, the concentration of the drug has, uh, that patient has, you may need either A, more Narcan uh, to get them out of that stuporous state that they're in, or you may need to redose them later because they may go back into an overdose because now Narcan fell out of that receptor site and the opioids are plugging back in again. So just understanding you know, what's going on. Your parasympathetic uh, nervous system has what's called muscarinic and nicotinic sites. And here is where that, uh, what I said before isn't necessarily true about uh, parasympathetic always slowing you down. There are muscarinic sites, there are nicotinic sites. Nicotine sound, or nicotinic sounds like what? Nicotine. So you can have a stimulatory effect by a stimulation of your parasympathetic nervous system. Let's use eating as an example, GI motility, uh, peristalsis, peristaltic wave motions of food. When we're eating, when we pull blood away from most of our major organs to now focus on the GI tract. And we have an increased GI motility now because of the increase in the, of the parasympathetic tone. And that's the nicotinic response to, to, to your eating, as an example. Muscarinic is a little different. Muscarinic is that inhibitory effect, if you will. So let me go ahead and put a, a picture up here for a second. This is atropine. Uh, atropine is a great drug. We use it. Uh, we used to use it all the time pre-hospitally. Uh, in the cardiac world, we've kind of gotten away from it. Not totally, but uh, a lot of it is we've gotten away from. But we still use it in the WMD world, um, and we still use it in certain cardiac events. Where, let's say, as, as an example, somebody's heart rate is too slow, and we want to pick up the heartbeat. Okay, we want to pick up the heart rate. Well. You could get pretty drastic, and you can give somebody straight epinephrine. Epinephrine is going to stimulate and have an agonistic effect. Alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2, it's going to hit them all, and you're going to get tachycardic, but it's like a runaway freight train. You really don't want to give epinephrine for bradycardia, at least in your adult population. Uh, in kids, you may have to, but that's a whole other story in, its, in and of itself. But So for us, sometimes we'll give atropine. And the big question that I typically like to pose to new paramedic students or to paramedic students in general is, does atropine speed your heart up? Is that its direct effect? So think about that for a second. I want you to hold that question in your, in your head. Does atropine speed up your heart? Now, let's look at the mechanism of action. How does atropine work in the, in the uh, scenario of bradycardia, slow heart rate? So... What ends up happening with bradycardia? Your heart rate is slow. Okay, maybe your parasympathetic tone is picked up. Uh, maybe you've had a vagal response and you've had increased parasympathetic tone. So when you bear down, you're actually releasing acetylcholine from your 10th cranial nerve or your vagus nerve. Well, this acetylcholine now goes to the receptor sites in your heart, as in this example, 
and it stimulates the muscarinic receptor sites, which thereby slows your heart rate down. This is uh, the, uh, the culprit of what we call a commode code. Uh, somebody's sitting on the toilet, they're bearing down hard to try and move their bowels. Well, they stimulate a lot of release of natural acetylcholine from your 10th cranial nerve, or your vagus nerve. They slow their heart rate down so profoundly that they go into cardiac arrest and we find them dead on the toilet. That's a commode code. So what we can do in vagal-induced type bradycardias is come along and we can give atropine. What atropine does, atropine is an anticholinergic drug. So with that being said, atropine comes along and binds to the muscarinic receptor sites of your parasympathetic nervous system, thereby making it an anticholinergic drug. It's going to go against the, the parasympathetic nervous system which allows sympathetic to now become the more dominant system in that yin and yang relationship. And now your heart rate is going to speed up. So the question that we originally asked is, does atropine speed up your heart? As a direct side effect of giving the medication, yes, your heart rate does speed up. But is that what the atropine actually did? No the atropine blocked the inhibitory effects of the parasympathetic nervous system, allowing sympathetic to be more dominant, thereby bringing up your patient's heart rate. So that's the relationship of atropine and, and using those terms. So just understanding those terms and understanding uh, uh, the terminology, it gives us a little bit of a better understanding as to how these drugs work. So with the last few minutes that we have, uh, what I want to talk about real quick is the absorption rate of some of these drugs uh, or how some of these drugs are absorbed and how a physical environment is going to affect how drugs are absorbed by the body and how the patients are going to respond. So let's take the average 200-pound individual. You give them X amount of drug and you're hoping to get X amount of a response. So we'll use fentanyl as an example. Fentanyl is typically given, uh, and I'm not, I'm not even going to quote a dose because every protocol is different. But the way I think about fentanyl is it is weight based. And it's typically two mics per kilo or something like that. We're not going to get crazy into that. But I think of it as 100, 150, 200 mics. That's how I typically dispense fentanyl uh, when I'm giving it to a patient for pain control. So if I've got a smaller individual that's in pain, I'll give them 100 mics. If I got a medium-sized individual, I'll give them 150 mics. I got a big individual, I'll give them 200 mics. And I'll base the reaction on that dosing. Uh, so if I give somebody who weighs 300 pounds 100 mics of fentanyl for a fractured femur or for whatever, it's not going to touch them. They're not even going to bat an eye at that. They're still going to be in significant pain. So I have to adjust my dose accordingly based on patient size. Um, and I got some, some notes over here. Uh, blood flow to the area. We talked about that. If you're giving a subcutaneous injection, an intramuscular injection, how is their peripheral perfusion? So if you have somebody who's getting shocky and they're pulling blood away from the skin into the core... All right, subcutaneous isn't a good idea. IM might not even be the best idea. You have somebody in severe anaphylaxis and they're going into shock on you at the paramedic level, we may want to consider giving epi via IV. And that's a whole other uh, category of, or a no, whole other conversation of how to administer that. The pH of the environment, the environment being the body. So last video, we talked about pH and how if somebody starts to become acidic, we talked about how oxygen won't bind to hemoglobin and certain drugs will have a hard time being absorbed. So if we have somebody who's in cardiac arrest and they're down for a while and they're suffering from metabolic and respiratory acidosis, their pH is way down, right? And so their acids are way up and it's not a hospitable environment for pharmaceuticals. So we start pushing drugs into this patient the efficacy of these drugs is going to be drastically affected by the pH of the environment, which is why we have to do good quality CPR. It's so important to get that blood flowing, get it oxygenated, get rid of those acids, or else all the drugs, even the defibrillatory attempts that we give, the electrical shocks we give, don't work well in an acidotic environment. We've got to get that pH balanced 
So electrical therapy will work. Drugs will work. So although you're thinking, oh, all I'm going to be doing is chest compressions. No, you've got probably the most important job out of everybody. Airway ventilation, or oxygenation rather, and chest compressions. Those are huge in maintaining that pH. Um, the concentration and the dose. We talked a little bit about that in the fentanyl example. But let's also talk about um, a maintenance dose or loading dose versus a maintenance dose. Okay. Certain drugs require what we call a blood serum level. And you have to, and I'll put the slide up here. And what we're going to look at is a therapeutic range, right, or a therapeutic index of a drug. So there are some drugs that we will give that have to reach a certain plasma level in the body in order for it to actually work and be effective. Uh, where other drugs, we give it one time, it hits its therapeutic index, and it's done. Some drugs have a huge therapeutic index, and I'm going to use diazepam or Valium as an example, Valium being the trade name, diazepam being the generic name. Uh, this is a benzodiazepine drug, it's a sedative hypnotic, and just in that term alone, sedative hypnotic, based on the dose you give, you will either have a sedative effect or a hypnotic effect based on how much you give. Same holds true for the therapeutic range. The therapeutic range for uh, diazepam alone is really pretty huge. Uh, in order for you to get to the toxic level of Valium, you really got to give somebody a lot. However, add some alcohol into the equation. Now we have a synergistic effect of 2 plus 2 equals 8, and we really put our patient down hard. So the therapeutic range for some drugs is pretty narrow. But in the pre-hospital environment, the doses that we're giving to somebody tend to be therapeutic. Um, there's not many that we would give that would put them into a toxic range. And here's food for thought for the newer ALS providers in the audience. And this is what I've always taught. If you're opening up two packages for one dose, rethink your math. You're probably wrong. Most of what we give pre-hospitally is packaged in the dose that we need or close to the dose we need. If you're opening multiple packages to give one dose of a medication, stop. <laughs> Rethink it. Do your math again. You may be wrong. So when we talk about a loading dose versus therapeutic dose, your anticoagulants, uh, warfarin, heparin, again, those are out of our uh, scope of practice. We don't play around with those. Um, Antipsychotic drugs, anti-seizure medications work uh, off of a therapeutic range as well or their maintenance dose. So you have a patient that you go and see and they've had a seizure and they haven't had a seizure in months. So part of your line of questioning in your sample in OPQRST is, well, do you take this medication? Yes. Do you take it as it's prescribed? Yes. Okay. One of the questions I ask patients who have seizure disorders and now they're seizing again is when was the last time you had your levels checked, right? So uh, Diltai, not Diltai, that's a calcium channel blocker. Uh, Dilantin, phenobarbital, Depakote, any of your anti-seizure medications, they have to be monitored and it has to be a certain level in the patient's body in order for it to work. So as they grow and they get larger and they get older and they gain weight, lose weight, whatever, the efficacy of those drugs are going to change. So they may have now fallen out of that therapeutic range and now they're having a seizure. So they have to get their medications checked and maybe have their dosages checked. Uh, birth control pill, another example. A young lady goes on birth control and the doctor writes the script, sends the young lady home with birth control pill and says, listen, you can't really start dancing the dance for about 30 days uh, without you know the fear of of getting pregnant because your body has to build up a certain level. So I have heard many a story of a young lady going home and the husband or the, the boyfriend's all excited and yeah, I'm on birth control now for the last two days. Let's, uh, let's, let's do the do. And they end up pregnant because they haven't allowed their body to get the full dose of that, that maintenance dose into their body. Uh, so it, it hasn't reached a certain level yet. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull this slide off. Okay, let me check my notes. And I think we're looking pretty good. We're at uh, 49 minutes, so we're right on track. This is video one of two on pharmacology. So when we come back 
for the next video, we'll start getting into specific drugs and how they work and what they do. And I'm not going to get into dosing necessarily because uh, every protocol is different. I'm not here to dictate policy or protocol. Uh, just in general terms, how these drugs work, what they do, mechanism of action, indications, contraindications, that kind of thing. Um, again, I've enjoyed it. Having a lot of fun doing these. Uh, I'll keep on doing them as long as uh, everybody's watching them and enjoying them. Uh, for my FBI folk, uh, the code word for this video is truck. Like a Chevy or a Ford or whatever. Truck. That's going to be our, our code word for this one. For everybody else, thank you for joining. Don't worry about truck. It uh, means nothing. It's just uh, what we do to keep people on track. And I think that's about it. All right, gang. Be safe, stay tuned, stay well, stay COVID-free, and we'll talk to everybody soon. Take care. Bye.